Hi, my name is Joffrey Miller, and I'm the instructor for Management 4335, Human Resource Management. And today I'm going to be going over uh, Chapter 1 of HR 4 by Denise and Griffin. And the first chapter is entitled The Nature, and hu Nature of Human Resource Management. So let's take a look at the, the learning objects of we want to describe contemporary human resource perspectives. We want to trace the evolution of human resource functions and organizations, of course, identify and discuss the goals of human resource management and take a look at the setting for human resource management and describe some of the job, uh, describe the job of a human resource manager from the perspective of professionalism and careers. Uh, and page four of your text, it gives uh, two definitions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is human resources? And it's simply, it's, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the people that the organization employs to carry out various jobs, tasks, functions in exchange for wages, salaries, and other rewards. Well, what, what are some of these other rewards? Some of the rewards are tangible, and some of them are, are, are not tangible. And what do we mean by non-tangible rewards? Well, it, things like job satisfaction, self-fulfillment, and meeting a higher level of needs. So uh, the next uh, definition is, what is human resource management? Uh, it is a comprehensive set of management managerial activities and tasks that help develop and maintain a qualified workforce. And uh, the, the text basically says is that uh, many experts in the field have come to recognize that no set of resources is more vital to the organization's success than human resources. I want to look at one more definition, and this is from another textbook, but uh, it is relevant to this one as well. And it talks about the definition of human resource management being the design of formal systems in an organization to manage human, re human talent for accomplishing organizational goals. So when we talk about, you know, when we talk about those uh, assets, um, you know, most people are familiar with financial, financial assets and intellectual property uh, and physical Assets, physical assets could be um, the firm's uh, property, the building, their equipment, and financial. Of course, is is um, you know what the what fun what cash they have on their books, what stocks that they are they are holding, what stocks they have sold, what debt they are, what debt do they own if they've lent lend if they've lended any money, and. Where are there, where are the resources being put? And then intellectual property, of course, are copyrights, trademarks, and those kind of things that uh, a company holds um, the right to, uh, whether it's a trademark, um, how they, the name of their company or their logo, or um, an actual patent on certain equipment. But, you know, a lot of the, a lot of people, they don't, they're just now starting to look at the, Looking at uh, the human human assets as a vital part of those four, and what I like to how I like to illustrate it, it's it looks very similar to a um, a four legged stool. And in, in my uh, the example I give is, is if you what what would happen if you were to remove the financial assets from an organization? Of course, it would collapse. There would not be any money to do the business. You know, if you didn't have uh, a place to do your business or you didn't have the equipment to do your business, the business would fall. If you did not uh, have trade secrets and intellectual property and uh, things that have been developed by knowledge workers, which we're going to talk more of, then, of course, the organization would fall. And the same with human. You know, if you have a walkout on a larger company and they go on strike, we've seen how that can just... Uh, literally shut down a company. Um, but uh, it's very much a vital part of the, the 
the whole entire assets of a company. So looking at this, um, I, I wanted to, I added this to the slide deck because I think it's very important because it's not discussed in the text. When we're talking about assets, we need to look at human capital. What do we mean by human capital? It's, a, it's the collective value of the capabilities and the knowledge, skills, and life experiences and motivation of, or, of an organizational workforce called intellectual capital to reflect the following contributions of employees, thinking and knowledge, creative and decision making. And this is the one, one area I think that is omitted and, and not looked at. Um, it's, an it's looked at as an intangible resource, but you know, when you really, they're, they're, it is very measurable. When we talk about, you know, when we talk about human capital, um, a lot of times we don't put a measure on the knowledge that walks out that door. So when we have turnover and we have employees that leave either voluntarily or involuntarily or they come to the end of their career and they're retiring, we, uh, we need to know, uh, we need to realize how much knowledge is going out that door. And that's where, you know, we'll talk later uh, in the course about knowledge management systems, we talk about that in uh, management information systems, about knowledge management systems where knowledge has to be captured because it can't go out that door and leave. There's got to be um, some way of collecting that knowledge from people and, and, of course, having systems to capture it. I give an example of this because this has been around for several years. My stepfather's uh, been deceased for many years but uh, and he was and he retired much more longer uh, back in the uh, probably the early 80s and uh, he was a uh, he was an engineer for Oklahoma Gas and Electric and he designed most of the substations that they use um, that splits up the the electrical power um, throughout different parts of the um, the state or the country, you know, even other states uh, that they managed. To, but uh, he had that knowledge because he designed most of, most of those systems. So they spent, literally spent um, the last year, year and a half of his career having somebody follow him around and, and ask him, how did you make this decision? Uh, what, 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 uh, how did you arrive at the decision to use this, this device over this, this other device? Or, you know, how did you... Why did you design it this way versus that way? Uh, because they had to capture that knowledge because it was going out the door. So knowledge is power, and it's also, you know, it's 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 not necessarily um, completely quantifiable, but it, we can definitely put a price tag on it. So when we talk about the merging, merging human resource management challenges, the challenge is the human resource management change daily. There's always something new that, that is coming out. And uh, uh, there's, always, there's always a change in a law, a ruling on a law, an interpretation of a law, an agency interpretation of a law, um, so a lot of it has to do with changes as laws, but it also has to change. It has to do with the 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 changing of the demographics within the workplace. The fact that we have four or five different generations, um, six if you're in a medical for field. When you talk about the people you're taking care of, um, it can be up to six or seven generations of people, um, which makes things very diverse and very different and can be a strength and it can be a weakness at the same time. So determining how and when to initiate layoffs, um, uh, I don't, you know, th that was definitely a, a, a bigger issue uh, around the 2007, 2008, 2009 period of time when there was a lot of layoffs. So we go through, um, we go through economic cycles where we have upturns and downturns and there are some times when we have to lay off people. And even, even uh, on a more sp smaller scale, you know, a lot of times, you know, just uh, maybe it may not be a mass layoff, but, you know, just the fact that a company is not meeting their, their bottom line, not meeting their budget, they will look at um, 
positions that they do not need. Um, they will prioritize those positions based on based on need. And a lot of times, uh, you know, good people uh, leave an organization because simply of uh, uh, they are being laid off. And, you know, it's uh, to me, it's bad. You know, when you see that happen once in a, once in a while, you know, it's OK, I guess. Uh, that's never OK to have to let people go. But, um, you know, it's it's understandable is a better way of putting it. It's understandable to have to lay off some folks uh, from time to time. But when you start to see a cyclical, you know, cycle of of every single year, um, you know, the budget comes out, you know, people ramp up, they utilize their financial resources, they, they, they spend outside the budget, and as a result, they have to lay people off. That's probably a company that you don't want to work for because um, it, it shows that they don't value uh, human assets and human capital, human resources, people, the way they should. Um, measures taken, adopting corporate social responsibility. You know, that's a very, that's a very, very big thing now. Um, if a company is not, uh, uh, socially responsible, um, a lot of folks, uh, will not go to work for them. It's a high priority for a lot of folks that, uh, when they're looking for companies to work for is, uh, whether a company is socially responsible. Uh, indulging in um, conscious capitalism or triple bottom line. Um, well, you know, I mean, uh, that's that's what makes uh, companies uh, profitable. But, you know, there's some companies now that, uh, you know, there has to be a bottom line, but uh, they are very socially conscious in the fact that, you know, um, uh, a company, I can't remember the name of the company at this point, particular point but I know that they they make shoes and for every for every um, pair that they they make they they make one and give it to somebody in need we see that quite often where people are starting to um, you know incorporate a different type of capitalism where they're socially responsible um, and they're trying to make a profit at the same time so when we look at contemporary human resource management perspectives, HR function requires professionals who can balance both ethical and legal concerns. And, you know, basically, and we're going to look a little more in depth on that um, for as far as the HR side. Some things are ethical, but uh, uh, legal, and some things are legal, but not ethical. But most of the time, if something is illegal, it is more than likely to be unethical at the same time. These concerns with uh, the organ these are concerns with organizational needs. And you know if we don't remain, if a company doesn't remain ethical and legal, we have seen how quickly um, they can lose competitive advantage. you know and we see that right now with um, we see that right now with Facebook, you know and how they have handled and been trust and how um, people that use Facebook have entrusted Facebook with their personal information and they have kind of squandered it. And uh, they've, they've, they've made a lot of excuses and they've made some of the same mistakes over and over again. So they're having to build their trust back. And you can see lately there's a, a couple commercials on how Facebook's trying to save their face, pardon the pun, pun but... They are really trying to dig themselves out of a hole, and uh, as far as what their reputation is, but it definitely uh, affects uh, competitive advantage. And why does HR? Um, why are they? You know, they're not the they're not the legal and ethical police per se, but they play a large role in that area. Um, most major corporations will have an ethics department or even an ethics officer usually they have a law background and they are the one person that makes the call on legal on ethical press precedent for that particular company so when we look at the shrinking they, a lot of people are saying that uh, hr is shrinking you know 
And when we look at HR shrinking, it really um, is not shrinking per se. Um, it's, it's restructuring in a different way. And it's always been the goal of HR to be more strategic and less administrative. And that is definitely happening now, especially in the major corporations. When you look at the smaller firms and people that are in HR, they will have a higher administrative burden and they may not be able to have as uh, much of a strategic um, uh, footprint within an organization, but uh, they can certainly have some. But, you know, a lot of this is, is, is taking, a lot of this is uh, taking place by out, outsourcing, outsourcing, you know, transactional uh, types of items. And, uh, uh, you know, that could be payroll. It could be anything that's repetitive, you know. Uh, but uh, where we see it the most is, uh, is uh, in a company like uh, Hospital Corporation America went to the, CEO, the, the center of excellence model where they have a center of excellence, which um, includes both... Um, uh, experts in certain areas of like uh, um, experts in certain areas like like labor relations um, or other areas of expertise um, benefits um, uh, compensation establishing the compensation philosophy for the entire company and keeping consistency among uh, programs such as um, um, uh, background checks and how those are performed and how they are adjudicated when we find something that's uh, less favorable on those. So uh, having the experts in the background that do some of the more detailed and set policy for the entire corporation that trickles down and also has, uh, you know, not necessarily out, you know, it's not outsourced, but it's kept, it's kept at uh, a call center, a call center that, uh, combined with the website where employees can update their own information, uh, maintain their own uh, administrative records as far as their address and their marital status may, um, or whatever um, information that's in, in a system that they can have control over as far as their address and that sort of thing, um, or change a business or benefits. They can go in and change those benefits themselves, or uh, they can go in and look at their own paycheck. And so... Um, yes, a lot of a lot of the payroll has been outsourced more more than anything else. Um, we see payroll as one of the biggest things outsourced. Excuse me. Um, we see that payroll is is outsourced more than any other function. Um, but uh, uh, when you look at it from a shrinking perspective, you know, like with HCA, we didn't sell it that way, and I, and I mean we didn't. When I say sell it, I mean we, we presented this new model to the, the employees um, as an extension of us, because that, and that really what is what it is. It's an extension. No, those functions were not, you know, we, we have a smaller HR department. We had smaller HR departments. We had HR business partners that handled certain uh, uh, business lines within the the. the hospital that I worked. So we were equivalent to managers, um, but uh, we all, each had our own uh, group of employees that we um, provided uh, HR services to. But the administrative functions were, a lot of those were handled by, and that included uh, recruit, recruitment and selection and actually bring onboarding of, of getting people to get, you know, to the front to that day one of being on the company, all that would be um, handled uh, in the background. So what that did is it freed up the HR business partners to go out and really take a, a bigger strategic role. So, you know, when we look at outsourcing and shrinking, that's really not accurate because it, uh, it kind of uh, marginalizes the role of HR and makes it look smaller when actually, you know, um, we, we sold it as, you know, you got me as an HR business partner. I'm here to give you immediate advice on anything that you need and consulting you on all HR, um, uh, all HR items and uh, whether they be employee relations related or whatever. But 
you know, I have this entire call center, I have this entire center of excellence, um, I have this entire benefit staff behind me. So it was a just, I was, you know, we, we, rep, we sold it as that we were representing all of that entire HR function. And it's the truth. You know, we had to tell, we, we were out there, you know, showing uh, employees how they can do things themselves online and who to call uh, within the call center and how to put in uh, tickets on things that needed to be changed, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, expanding a little bit more on HR's role in the organizational ethics, um, this slide is also not in your deck. Um, it's been added. But uh, again, you know, there, it comes down to two different things, whether something is a legal question or an ethical question. And when we look at legal questions, um, those are basically um, dealing with, uh, you know, does the, does the behavior or the result meet all applicable laws, regulations, and government codes? So that's what we have to look at when we're looking at a legal question. And that's what um, HR spends a, a, a large portion of their time is, um, uh, you know, handling legal questions. No, we're not attorneys, um, but I, my boss, in fact, at HCA, had a law degree. I mean, there's a lot of HR professionals out there that are getting law degrees just so they can keep up with the laws. Um, so that just basically highlights the importance of keeping, you know, a company. And it basically boils down to, you know, an HR, an HR business partner, HR manager, whatever. Their main focus is on exposure. Exposure to supervisors and managers, exposure to the company, and <clears throat> and also looking out for the interests of the employee at the same time. An ethical question does, comes down to, does it, the behavior or result meet both organizational standards and professional standards of ethical behavior? And usually these are set up in, in some type of ethical code um, that an organization will um, put into their um, their mission, vision, and values. Um, they will also have, you know, what they consider ethical and unethical. In a medical uh, field, um, you know, certainly there's a lot of things that are ethical or unethical, and, and, you know, it's to the point where they have an ethics officer that looks at those kind of things. So let's take a look at this other slide here. This one is also not in your textbook or slide deck, um, but I will put this out for everybody to look at. But, you know, it, it, it is very important. So HR and organizational ethics, you know, you got ethical treatment, um, uh, but the areas of potential ethical problems in HR they always deal with compensation, development, staffing, performance management, EEO, and training, and how they handle those issues ethically. Are they are they are they handling them ethically? Are they um, enforcing the the workplace rules of an organization consistently, all the way across? So that influences the con, you know, that influences uh, all the cons the consequences for ethical treatment, in job satisfaction, turnover, absenteeism, commitment, job performance, or ethical decisions. Let's take a look at this a little bit closer um, of, so, of some examples of HR related ethical misconduct, and uh, basically, uh, you know. It falls within three different categories, starting with compensation, and then employee relations, and then staff, staffing and equal, equal employment. And if we're looking at the compensation area, you know, some of the uh, uh, HR ethical misconduct that they are looking for is um, employees that are misrepresenting the hours and the time they work, and. Um, some companies and some government agencies, you know, when somebody um, uh, has somebody clock in for them before they get to the office or they um, have somebody clock out later for them after they've already left, 
um, or takes care of clocking them back in for lunch. We call this theft of time. And uh, that's, that's a major ethical issue, and it goes against the rules. Of, it, not only does it go against the rules of the company as far as when and how you're supposed to clock in and out, but you know, it goes beyond that. It goes, it's, it's, it's actually a form of theft. Um, falsifying work, work, falsifying work expenses reports that happens, you know, where somebody lies about their that the the amount of miles that they drove, or you know, um, they failed to subtract the time that they had the government vehicle, or or the, not necessarily government vehicle if you're in government, yes, but uh, the company vehicle, they they failed to subtract out the the uh, mileage that they use for their own personal benefit you know maybe a company says well you know you can use a car for personal business but you have to subtract out those hours uh, showing personal bias and per in performance appraisals and pay increases oh my gosh we're going to talk very in very much detail on um, uh, the different types of biases and um, you know is a bias a prejudice? A, bit, a bias can be a prejudice, and a prejudice can be a bias, but um, basically um, there are all kinds of biases on how we look at employees, um, how we manage our employees. You know, for instance, um, in uh, evaluations they call, you know, they, they call it the, the halo or horn effect. You know, and the halo or horn effect is that they tend to look at every employee that they have a manager may have under them as as being, you know, perfect all the way across. Doesn't want to identify anything negative. You know, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we got um, managers that you know um, might mark everybody down even when they don't deserve it. You know, on their evaluations, and then we got another bias, which is central tendency, uh, where you know uh, an you know, a supervisor might uh, think that everybody is like middle of the road. Instead of looking at each individual employee for their merits and their performance, they just take the easy way out and maybe just, you know, rate everybody average. Um, you know, and then there are the biases with recruiting. You know, there's one that gets a lot of people in trouble, which is, um, you know, like me or just like me. You know, uh, people are attracted to people that are most like them or have, have or something that they have in common. So when somebody comes in for an interview and say that I'm a runner and, you know, a runner, you know, a person comes in and I says, tell me about yourself, which is a question I would never ask in an interview, but we'll get into that later in recruiting. Um, and they say, well, I'm a runner, and I do this, and blah, blah, blah. And, oh, and then they get off on a side conversation about running. And, um, you know, the person doing the recruiting might, might be biased because they like, you know, they hang out with runners, you know. So, you know, we're going to talk a lot about those, uh, those uh, biases. But allowing deliberate and inappropriate overtime classifications, um, you know, this has to do with... Uh, um, this has to do with uh, uh, classifying employees as being exempt or non-exempt, um, and whether they are they are um, classified um, appropriately by the Fair Labor Standard Act. Um, but allowing deli deliberate inappropriate overtime uh, in the classifications, you know. Um, you know that's that gets somebody that gets that should be salary, but they're actually you know, uh, or you know the other the other way also. But uh, and then there's just uh, misusing overtime. You know, uh, taking overtime or allowing an employee to have overtime that they don't that they don't need or uh, deserve for that matter. Uh, accepting personal gains and gifts from from vendors. You know this is definitely an ethical issue you know most companies will set a limit government sets a limit um, most cities and state governments do for their employees also let's take a look at the employee relations employees lying to supervisors and co-workers um, definitely you know um, when we look at hallmark 
you know, that's why we have the honesty and integrity and those t- types of different character um, uh, character traits um, because those are also uh, standards that are set up within an organization. They will have a set of values that they try to follow. Executives and managers emailing false public information to customers and vendors. That's misrepresenting your company. And uh, it can that can be an illegal thing as well. Um, misusing and stealing organizational assets and supplies. I mean, this is as old as <laughs> the beginning of the workplace where people might take a pen or a pencil and then they, things start to add up. And then they say, well, if I can take this and I can take this and if I can take that, I can take this, you know, pretty soon, you know. They got, um, you know, there was one case where in the city of San Antonio, I was not involved in the investigation, but I uh, got briefed about it, where uh, a, a person that had worked 30 or 40 years had stolen, um, oh my gosh, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tools over the time that he had worked. And... Uh, eventually it caught up with him and after like 30 30 years with the city um, I think he ended up getting arrested Um, so you know that can start out small and and snowball real quick Uh, intentional violating of safety and health regulations Uh, we will uh, that is a definite uh, one that um, uh not only can cause injury to the employees, but can also cause injury to the public. And when we're hiding these things, uh, these violations, uh, in order to get our pro- product out or our service out, what we're doing is um, we're actually we're actually uh, you know putting people's lives at risk, and that's not a good thing. So let's take a look at the staffing and equal employment. Uh, discriminatory favoritism in hiring and and promotion and that kind of goes hand in hand with the biases that I was talking about you know um, uh, a lot of the systemic uh, discrimination has been eliminated has gone away but you know there are still times when uh, you know there are individual cases that do come up and you know as an HR manager you've got to be able you've got to be on those real quick because, uh, you know, not only is it exposure for the company, it's exposure to the, 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 the person doing the harassing. And, of course, you know, the poor victim, you know, that's gone through it, you know, they leave, they may leave the company. And like I said earlier about, you know, an employee leaving the company, you know, all their talent and, and knowledge and skills that they have brought um, and then the cost of uh, rehiring that individual can be astronomical. Um, but sexual harassment should never exist in a workplace, and that's something that uh, if it's not set from the top. And with the Me Too movement right now, we've got a lot of scrutiny on companies, and we've got a new set of sexual harassment that I want to discuss further down the road in other chapters where Um, We have some new sexual harassment that's emerging within the organization. I guess not, you know, there's really no new sexual harassment, but it's new in that um, how it's, uh, how the culture was developed. I will say that. And uh, one of the um, articles that I have out on the blackboard is called the bro culture. And it's definitely something to look at. That is what I'm talking about. Um, it, it's a phenomenon that's been existing in, within the um, the IT world, and uh, it's uh, you know it's it it starts out that the, some of these these small tech companies start out small, and they explode in size, and they do a lot of hiring like me, and you know the like me's are young usually younger employees that don't have a lot of life experience under their belt and what's happened is that they've you know they've hired their fraternity brothers and this that and the other and pretty soon you know um they start acting like a big giant college fraternity uh within the male community and that's caused that's set up a whole set of 
different sexual harassment types of issues that um, weren't as traditional as before. So we will take a look at that in more detail later. But uh, conducting uh, inappropriate background investigations. Now, like I said, you know, with the, the center of excellence uh, model, those are handled, um, those are hand, that's a, one of the reasons why that function has been sent to a center of excellence to, a, to one person. You can imagine, you know, when, when we say, talk about adjudicating background investigations within the workplace, what we're talking about is um, we are, uh, we have found something on a, uh, uh, we have found something on a background investigation that needs to be taken a look at closer. And, you know, there, and then within the United States, um, there's a big movement to, um, it's called check the box, you know, eliminate the box, or I have to remember exactly how it's worded, but basically, you know, it has to do with uh, not, not asking an employee to check, check a box on whether they've had a, um, whether they've been, uh, uh, incarcerated or, or you know um, actually charged with a crime until after an offer's been made but we certainly you know when somebody's adjudicating saying okay for this particular job if they've done this type of crime and it's ro rose to this level then we are not going to allow them to come to work for this company so the best thing to do in that is that you know instead of having all these companies within HCA, all these different hospitals, like I use HCA as an example because it's a very large corporation, uh, but instead of having, you know, one person at each hospital, you just have one person in the background doing the adjudicating. That way that they can, they can, if they set a precedent that it's followed each time consistently. And with our study of chapter one, we'll be looking at the evolution of human resource, the, the evolution of the human resource function. The first study of management uh, was the science was scientific management. The intern was uh, concerned with um, structuring the individual jobs to maximize efficiency and productivity. The major proponents of scientific management, such as Frederick Taylor, who was also considered the father of of management, uh, had had a ba had a background in engineering and often used time and motion studies in which managers use stopwatches to teach workers precisely how to perform each task that was made up of the job. So it was, a, it was concerned with um, measurement, measurement of efficiency and productivity, um, how well the product was, um, you know, how well the product was produced, um, error rates, and um, how long it took the product to be produced efficiently and, and effectively. So uh, the origins of human resource management also um, went back to the Hawthorne studies, and I've got a link here on the slides that I'm going to put out uh, that talks about the Hawthorne studies. Um, I also got that on Blackboard, but basically, you know, they did several studies within a factories with light. Um, uh, they would put uh, more light, less light adjust you know adjusting different things and uh, to try to figure out uh, what impact that would have on the employees um, and uh, uh, from there they could uh, you know they, they thought that they had uh, made some findings but the findings were really off when they stopped doing the adjusting of the light um, they were originally saw an increase in productivity but when they stopped doing it, they stopped the experiment and pulled the, the lighting, you know, put the lighting back to what it originally was, the productivity continued. And uh, that was the first time that they, they figured out that uh, by, you know, it was the uh, managers and supervisors when they were changing the lighting and everything were also talking and spending time with the employees, which we affectionately call now in leadership as management by wandering around. And uh, the, with the interaction of the managers and supervisors with the employees and uh, improves the, the productivity. And then uh, there's uh, McGregor's Theory X, Theory Y, and, uh, you, know, theory, you know, Theory X was that, um, you know, um, 
it uh, basically um, identified two types of managers. One was the Theory X manager, thought that uh, employees were inherently lazy, um, were not motivated, and were not creative. Um, and would only produce if they were forced to, and you know, only could only be managed, not led. Uh, versus theory Y, which um, you know that uh, employees are in, inherently have a drive to work, are creative, and can be led. Um, a totally different uh, uh, look. So, uh, but but these this along with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, I've got some videos posted out on Blackboard that shows how today, even today, these theories um, still have a prominent spot in uh, the field of HR, uh, and they're still being looked at. Now, like when I first started, uh, or the first video that I put out, um, I made it very clear that, um, yes, there are theories, and we're going to be studying, continuing to study theories, but the our main focus is on the application. And when we look at the Hawthorne studies, that's a perfect example of how, you know, they were trying to gather data to do a, uh, uh, an academic study and found it was just uh, plain old management by wandering around and, and, and inspiring employees to, um, uh, to uh, do what they do. So, uh, and uh, that uh, evolved into the field of uh, personnel management. And um, personnel management, growing organizations began to create specialized units to cope with the increasing hiring needs, deal with government regulations, and provide a mechanism for better dealing with the behavioral issues. Uh, during the 1930s and 1940s, these units, uh, units gradually became known as personnel departments. And their main focus and their main purpose was to, um, was, to was, was hiring and getting people into the organization and replacing, uh, and placing uh, employees uh, due to turnover. So that's how it all started, and then it was also further evolved through World War II, and, and you know, the, the military did lots of studies on, you know, the theories of motivation, et cetera, and, uh, of course, they were the first proponents of using testing for new recruits, which eventually evolved into its use in, in uh the workplace, um, you know, even the ASBAB, I don't know how how many years that's been around, it's probably been around for quite a while, um, is basically the same study that, you know, that I came in in the 1980s still exists. Um, but, uh, you know, that that's what, uh, you know, that, that from that test, um, They were able to determine, um, you know, uh, which uh, career fields that uh, different recruits should be placed in, and uh, they also um, refined the test so that they were both valid and reliable, which is what we look at today when we um, institute any type of, of uh, assessment or test in the workplace. Is that we need to make sure that it's both valid and reliable. Um, human resource management in the electronic age. Um, I've got a link to a video there. Um, it's, uh, it shows um, uh, some of what the new technology will look like in HR. Um, you know, I, I went to a uh, conference uh, a couple months ago and it was talking about um, the, uh, how uh, the field of technology within HR is growing. And if, basically, if you can't um, apply if your employees can't apply for jobs on their phones, then you know you're you're way behind. If you're managing your processes with spreadsheet with spreadsheets and uh, just with spreadsheets, um, you're not you're not um, where you need to be te te technologically as far as HR is concerned. But the increase of knowledge workers, employees whose job are concerned with the acquisition 
uh, with the uh, acquisition and application of knowledge. Um, you know, I mean, it can, it's anywhere between people that um, are working with high-level electronics and, and computer systems to attorneys to doctors. Basically, every single, when you look at it really closely, basically um, even um, labor jobs, um, a lot of labor jobs can be considered knowledge workers. You know, my, my son, for instance, is, is a diesel mechanic, and those systems are very extremely uh, sophisticated and have to be analyzed with computer systems, et cetera. So, you know, it's, you know, the argue, argument can be made that a majority of the workforce today is knowledge workers, and I've got a video of, uh, of that out on the Blackboard for Chapter 1 also that's very good. Um, we will be discussing that in more detail later. Um, but, uh, you know, the bottom line is, is that they contribute through specialized knowledge and application of that knowledge. So what are the goals of human resource management? It's it pretty much, uh, if, if we are truly strategic partners, as HR managers, if we are truly strategic partners with management, then we're also concerned with, you know, the organization, whether the organization has a competitive advantage. And, and with that comes the enhancing of productivity and uh, the product, productivity and quality. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, that's what we have an influence on. And, you know, it's, uh, um, that's, that, that's what the main focus is. But complying with legal and social obligations, um, I lost my train, train of thought there for a second. Uh, complying with legal and social obligations, uh, yes, you know, again, uh, organizations are ju judged based on their, um, by their uh, social, you know, whether they are concentrating on social welfare of, of, of the Companies that they um, do business with, that they hire labor from, and what, how those employees are treated. Uh, the legal, uh, complying with legal obligations, of course, is all the, the labor laws, which I have listed out on under the resources tab in Black, Blackboard. I have all of the labor laws that include the, e, the equal opportunity laws as well. Um, but... Uh, Promoting individual growth and development is a big one. Um, you know, uh, even, you know, most larger organizations have a training and development department, but still the HR business partners are going to have a brunt of that uh, on them to go out and do training uh, needs analysis to find out what kind of training um, uh, their employees uh, uh, need to succeed in what they're doing, and that's a very big part of it is not just the training, but uh, they say growth and development, but training and development and training are two different things, and we'll probably discuss that a little bit more in the future, but training is, is uh, occupational tasks where development is more uh, soft skills such as communication, problem solving, um, supervision and management, leadership, um, all of those type of soft skills. Um, but HRM is viewed as part of a psychological contract with the employees. And, and uh, if I can find it real quick here. No, I can, yeah. So find, psychological contract is the overall set of expectations held by an employee with regard to what he or she will contribute to the organization and help the organization with regard to what it will provide to to the individual in return. So um, that's that's what a psychological contract is, and that's very much a a, a part of um, you know when that psychological contract is broke. I mean, that's when people start to leave an organization for a variety of reasons. But uh, we have to be very uh, cognizant 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 of that at all times. I'm sorry. I'm, my mouth is dry. But um, yes, that's very important. So let's take a look at some HR approaches to improving productivity. It's a little bit more detailed than the, the, the general overview that I gave. And again, 
Um, this came out of Mathis Jackson, which is another book, but it's applicable to what we're, we're looking at also. Um, but the HR approaches to improving productivity is uh, looking at organizational restructuring, redesigning work, um, aligning HR activities, and outsourcing analysis. So under organizing and reconstruction, reconstructing, we're looking at revising organizational structures. And I, I did a lot of that type, type of work for HCA where I was actually, you know, draw, drawing out the squares for the organizational structure of stand-ups of different departments and who would fall under whom and what the, their job title would be and what level of management that they would fall into and how their, the, those positions were priced out, et cetera, as far as compensation. Um, reducing staff, um, that's another uh, part of re, uh, restructuring. Uh, you know, sometimes we have to reduce our staff. Sometimes when we do that, Hopefully we don't have to lay people off. We can do it by attrition when we have to. In other words, we just uh, don't replace them as they as they leave voluntarily or involuntarily. Um, aiding, uh, mer aiding with mergers and acquisitions. You know, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of acquisitions um, don't work, but it's HR's responsibility to make sure that those acquisitions um, go through smoothly. Part of that, part of that is uh, making sure that when a new or when the organization being uh, acquisitioned, uh, the employees are aware of the uh, acquisitioning company's policies and procedures, and whether they sometimes. As part of an acquisition agreement, they'll merge policies or, mer you know, merge part of their, you know, the old company's policies. But for the most part, you know, they either, they take over and when they take over, the, the workforce either accepts it or uh, leaves. And uh, sometimes that, that happens. They'll have a, um, a large um, group of employees that will leave. And sometimes, on the other hand, you know, if, if the company that's acquired, Acquisitioning them is better. Sometimes uh, they will stay, um, and that's the hope: is that um, you know that you know that you have the um, the positive uh, that you have the uh, advantage over the the company that's being acquisition. So aligning HR activities, tracking and retaining employees, um, training and development, and evaluating employees. So you know. When we look at HR, we have to look at HR from the life cycle of the employee. And that's from uh, the time that they are a candidate till the time that they um, hopefully will, uh, you know, go an entire career with. But in this day and age, uh, the lifelong employment is, is very rare. Uh, but uh, we still have to look at the life cycle of the employment from the time that they're hired in making sure that um, you know that uh, we're retaining them by keeping them motivated and again watching our um, employees that are very good that are flight risk and making sure that we identify flight risk and making sure that they stay motivated um, and that we're compensating employees correctly you know um, you know where 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 is your company as far as uh, uh, where is your company as far as uh, uh, compensation, as far as its philosophy? Do they want to be 80% of the market or do they want to be 100% of the market or 110% of the market? You know, there's leaders and laggers when it comes to compensation. Um, looking at redesigning work, changing the workloads and combining jobs. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, that we do, you know, we do... Uh, either job enlargement or job enrichment. Job enrichment means that um, uh, that we are changing the functions of the job to be more um, enriching. Sometimes we'll take we can take some some parts of a job and combine it with another and 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 split the split the duties and maybe um, allow you know if we've got a workforce that has been consistently with, you know, a company, say 500 employees, and you've had some long-term employees, 
a lot of times, uh, um, a lot of times, uh, the empl- I'm sorry, I got distracted. Um, a lot of long-term employees, um, uh, they 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 top out in their jobs. They top out as far as salary. Um, so, you know, if they're not going to be motivated with staying with the job that they're in, sometimes uh, you can keep them by just changing the job. Because, you know, um, if you're in an organization that only has um, so far so many jobs to move up to. Um, and you uh, and that employee's happy working with the company or happy with the company but bored with their job, sometimes you can redesign their jobs, rotate employees from one job to another, um, and, and assist them with professional development so that maybe they can become a supervisor or something. Um, so those are all things that you have to look at when you're an HR manager. You have to be really on top of not just the groups of employees but every employee out there and what they're individual situation is and how they contribute to the company. But outsourcing analysis, um, this is uh, another area where, you know, we have to look at, um, you know, if your benefits, most benefits are are, um, outsourced now, they're not internal. So using domestic vendors and contractors instead of uh, employees, outsourcing operations, internationally so you know when we start uh, you know um, some companies will um, you know outsource to uh, countries outside the United States so that's kind of the approaches of improving productivity within an organization with the goals of increasing organizational productivity and reducing unit and labor costs and that's what it's all about is uh, helping with the bottom line you know and and as we reduce uh, the administrative loads in, or- in organizations, past and future, or really at this point right now, um, in, in a majority of the companies that are larger, uh, but uh, in the past, the strategic role, as you see at the top of the triangle there, was very small. And the op- operational role has pretty much stayed the same, um, but the administrative lo- load was much bigger. And uh, so... Uh, uh, the operation role is also being the employee advocate. So um, the the roles have changed. Uh, when we look at the role of an HR manager uh, within an organization, um, you know, it's it's kind of a 59-49, 51-49 um, situation where, you know, 51% of you is representing management and 49% of you is, is advocating for the employee. So, and then we also got to look at the evolution of the employee um, himself or herself. And in the past, you know, we had nine to five work days. Uh, now it's work anytime, uh, working in a corporate office. Uh, now it's working anywhere, especially with technology and devices. Uh, using company equipment and it's use any device, bring your own device. That's another policy that's that we talked about in management information systems that has its uh, pluses and minuses. Uh, Using company equipment, um, uh, that was the first part of that, and using your own device. Uh, Focusing on inputs, and instead of focusing on inputs, we're going to be focusing on outputs. Um, Climbing the corporate ladder, creating your own ladder, and again, you know, um, it's it's not a you know, binary system where it's just one way. Now, sometimes um, some companies will try an employee out, let them try out different apartments just on their own and say, hey, I want to try this and until they find their own way and find their own career ladder. So where, uh, you know, employees are in some companies are being allowed to create their own career path, you know, so that's another huge change. Uh, predefined work versus customizing work. You know, why does this individual have to do this set of duties versus doing this set of duties? Well, we want we want all employees to be doing um, doing work that contributes to the competitive advantage. But you know, we might we might have you know the workplaces are more flexible today than they were uh, because they are constantly changing. Um, 
So the predefined work is kind of going, you know, a lot less in a lot of different firms. Um, um, I don't know how many of you, I'm sure that a lot of you have worked in an organization where uh, somebody hoarded work. Um, that's something that I absolutely hate. Um, you know, the person that won't give you their knowledge because they're afraid that they're going to lose their job to an organization that shares information. And then when going from an organization where the employee has no voice to sharing information. And um, uh, again, um, relies on, you know, the <laughs> we relied on emails. Uh, now we're relying on uh, collaboration software technologies. We discussed a, a lot of that in management information systems about collaboration of technologies. We're also looking at the focus of, on knowledge and the focus on adaptive learning instead. Um, corporations learning and corp corporate learning and teaching is now um, turning into what they call demo democratized learning and teaching. So uh, HR departments in smaller versus larger organizations um, Smaller organizations require line managers to handle, handle their basic HR functions. Uh, employees receive less training, uh, exempt from many, uh, and, and some smaller organizations, of course, uh, are exempt from many uh, legal regulations and laws, just depending on the size they are. A lot of, a lot of the EEO um, um, laws don't even apply to a company until they hit 20. And they say, well, how can you discriminate? Well, you know, like, think of the mom and pop organization. Um, they can discriminate all they want as far as, uh, you know, as long as they're doing it, uh, you know, as long as they're, you know, uh, doing the right thing. Um, but uh, they can't really be challenged for, for discriminating. Um, if they're outright saying that they won't hire a minority, that's a different situation than, you know, uh, it's a family business, and the family gets promoted over other people. Uh, larger organizations, you know, of course, you know, once you hit that 200, 250 employee uh, level, you have to start looking at having your own separate HR department. And it can start out with, uh, it requires at least an HR manager and possibly an HR assistant and some some even start out without an assistant, and the HR manager does it all. Uh, HR functions have specialized subunits, you know, within organizations that are larger. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, some of these subunits are um, like comp and benefits and training and development. Uh, they might have somebody that's in charge of uh, recruiting, somebody that's in charge of... Uh, training development, that sort of thing. So HRM as a staff versus line function. Line managers directly responsible for creating goods and services. Those are the ones that are out on the front lines and making sure that the product and the service gets delivered. You know, staff managers are, are that's what HR managers are. They're staff managers. They're responsible for an indirect or, for an indirect or support function that would uh, have that would have costs. That would have costs. Uh, bottom line and contributions are less direct. Uh, recent trend: HR activities are carried out by line managers. Some firms have HR departments structured around centers of excellence, or that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, centers of excellence, or um, that uh, you know have the have uh, a staff that backs them up. Uh, that pro pro probably at a different location. So, the typical division of HR responsibilities and select, uh, selecting interviewing. Uh, this is an example of how uh, HR and uh, line manager functions uh, uh, are split and share both split and shared. Uh, HR department they develop legal and effective interviewing techniques. Trains managers for conducting selective interviews. Conducts they can they can they conduct interviews and tests. Send top applicants to the managers for final interview and check references. Um, 
they do a final interviewing of hiring and certain job classifications. Um, also, uh, and the managers advise HR on openings, and they usually do that through submitting some type of a requisition, whether it's paper form or electronic. Most of them are electronic now. Uh, decide whether to do their own final interviewing, um, receive interview training from HR unit, do final interviewing and hiring where appropriate and review reference information and provide feedback to HR department on hiring or rejecting decisions. Uh, the next um, slide, uh, human resource management system as a system is integrated, interrelated approach to managing human resources recognizes interdependence um, among various tasks and functions that must be performed. HR subs subsystems affect and are affected by other organizational subsystems. subsystems. So, you know, when you look at, uh, when you look at the, the bigger picture of a department, when we talk about subsystems affecting um, subsystems affecting HR, you know, it's a, uh, um, HR is kind of inter, intertwined with all subsystems. Uh, marketing, um, you know, they, they may have to go to HR uh, as far as employee branding, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, producing uh, marketing products that help the employee identify with the company and 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 our um, and our ambassadors to that company by doing employee branding. Um, the the uh, HR department is always in contact with the CFOs and the the people that make the budgets because they have to make sure that the FTEs that they have to hire and, and to fill are still valid, you know. Um, FTEs are, you know, full-time equivalent, um, what they call full-time equipment, full-time equivalent of an employee. So when a, one FTE would be one 40-hour, 80-hour every two-week employee, and then it breaks down from there. So, and that's how they manage the budget of employees coming in is how many FTEs they have and how many of them are filled. Um, HR subsystems affect, uh, HR, HR um, also does utility analysis, and this is an attempt to measure the impact and effectiveness of HR practices in terms of metrics such as a firm's financial performance. There are all kinds of metrics, uh, uh, you know, um, cost per turnover is one big one, um, cost per hire, cost per training, you know, there's a lot of different indicators that uh, can end up on some executive's dashboard that says how well HR is doing. Uh, another one uh, that's a little bit more ambiguous is uh, employee engagement and what those employee engagements uh, score say how happy are the employees at what they're doing and uh, we're going to cover that a little in a lot more detail as we go further along uh, characteristics of a contemporary HR managers um, they understand the different specialized areas such as legal environment processes of change so they have to be changing change managers and they also have to uh, be involved in labor relations and they have to be involved in labor relations whether they have a union, union or not because uh, HR, uh, HR uh, uh, tries to do union avoidance. Um, you know, there, there's companies that got code words for um, what's, uh, union avoidance. I don't want to say union busting. And those those code words usually have healthy work environment or some type of uh, uh, phrase like that where um, they have policies put in place that attempt to address concerns that a union would present to an individual employee so that 
they will not see a need to form a union. So if they're if the union says, you know, we'll fight to get you differential pay, well, why not just go ahead and give it to them? Uh, if the union says, we'll make sure that you get callback pay, um, go ahead and give it to them. If they say that you're going to have, um, do, you know, that you're going to have for cause or due process in, in disciplinary actions, go ahead and give it to them. I'm not in favor of employee at will, and we will get more involved in that later as we in our studies as far as at will and for cause employers. Um, I, I don't, I've never been a big fan of, uh, of uh, at will uh, because of the challenges that go with it. So possess general management abilities that reflect conceptual, diagnostic, and analytical skills. So, you know, uh, to be in HR, you've got to have some analytical skills and you've got to have social skills. You've got to be able to, um, you know, uh, be looking at budgets one minute and, and trying to figure, talking, <laughs> talking an employee off the ledge if they're, you know, um, about to quit or give up. Uh, so you have to be you have to be well versed in psychology and well versed in business and and uh, everything in between. Yeah. So here are you know and this is again um, this is covered throughout the book, but I wanted to put this up front in this chapter so we can kind of get a centering on exactly what the main HR management functions are. And the first one is HR strategy and planning. Um, you know, we have to, you know, the strategy has to be in line with whatever the strategic goals are of the organization. And the planning comes as far as, you know, we want to grow by 20%. Well, if that growth is going to uh, co have to coincide with, with, with recruitment and getting the amount of employees to support that 20%. Equal employment opportunity is concerned with making sure that you know, we have a fair and equitable hiring process that we, you know, have a fair and equal, equitable, um, a fair and equitable promotion process that when we, ta then we that when we have to take um, uh, administrative action against our employees, that we do it, we do it fairly. And that, and that brings us to um, one of the biggest, um, if you don't, if you walk away with one thing from this class, let it be known that you need, as managers and supervisors, you need to be fair. Fairness um, will keep you out of court. Fairness will keep you out of trouble. You can make mistakes as a manager or supervisor, but you will not recover from those mistakes if you're not fair and equitable. So, uh, and then uh, looking at uh, staffing, um, you know, uh, even though you're not a recruiter uh, per se, uh, organiza bigger organizations have recruiters, medium-sized organizations, some of the recruitment might be done by the HR manager or HR business, HR business partner, but you certainly are, are keeping uh, keeping account of how many people you have in your organizations and you're working with the recruiters to get those positions fi filled. And you're also telling them in what priority, too. Um, talent management, uh, that's training and development, that's, um, you know, just uh, succession planning. Succession planning is, is making sure that, you know, that your um, higher level or more hard to fill positions have somebody in, in mind, possibly even have somebody in mind, you know, and, they, and again, going back and asking that question, if this employee leaves tomorrow, how is it going to have an impact? Are you going to look locally for somebody? Are you going to look outside the local area? Are you going to use, um, are you going to use your inter internal recruitment or are you going to use an executive, um, executive search firm? So lots of different questions that have to be answered. Uh, rewards, rewards, I mean, you know, in lean times, you know, bonuses might not be as, uh, bonuses might not be as prevalent. And so you have to come up with other ways of rewarding, you know, and, and rewarding doesn't have to be all about monetary things. It can be, um, 
It can be uh, just as simple as what they call, we had wow cards, which were given uh, from one employee to another, uh, recognizing that they, that they, that they were uh, caught doing, you know, caught doing something good, uh, following the, um, the, uh, uh, the values of, of the company that had. And we had all those values listed on that card. And when somebody, you know, was, you know, very honest about a situation or showed integrity or showed compassion for others or whatever, and when, any of those goals, they could mark that on there and, and pass it. And when they collected so many of those cards, you know, there was some, uh, there was a little bit of an award thing that they could get little prizes for or whatever. And you'd be surprised how some of these little programs that you may think are inconsequential are very important. Risk management and worker protection. You know, a lot of companies, you know, will have uh, somebody that does the, does the risk management, does the work, worker protection programs and the workers' comp. Um, others, it falls falls to the manager uh, or the HR generalist. Uh, employee and labor relations, like I said, um, you know, and labor relations has to be, uh, you need to be constantly you know, whether you have union employees or not, you need to be aware of what's going on and what the unions are out there doing and whether they're, they're, they're looking to move into your organization. Um, in this uh, diagram here, this is in the textbook, it shows human resource management as a center of expertise and uh, not just a center of expertise, you know, they're, HR can be a center of expertise within the actual organization, or they can have a center for a center for expertise um, at another location. And just it depends on how you're structured and what the functions they are as a center of expertise. But like I said, all of the uh, functions are interrelated. Operations guys are going to want to make sure that they have enough people to do the work. Marketing, you're going to make sure that. You know that we're out. You know that even HR. You know, uh, is their recruiters are out there. Um, you know, uh, giving the right information about the company and making sure that they are marketing, not just for, not just for business for the company, but for employees, and that we're giving the right message. Um, and finance, I mean, everything's driven behind finance, and whether we can afford to hire more or we have to reduce. And then it comes to the other functions, that work, uh, other organizational functions, but the human resource function is the center of the center of expertise. Um, careers in human resource management, um, there's not too many HR jobs out there, even at a lower level, that don't require a degree. I mean, I just, this is just flat out. You might be able to get away with an associate degree, but very seldom. You know, I see um, VPs and higher level directors that have JDs behind their name, master's level behind their name. Um, you know, like I said, there's a big trend about HR, people in HR getting law degrees. You know, not to practice law, but just, you know, so they have a better understanding of law. But providing entry-level employment opportunities as an HR manager, there's not too many of those. Um, they want you to work your way up. Uh, line management can be used as a route for HRM. I mean, if you are, even if you don't go on HR right after graduating from school, you might want to look at that as a cross-functional move to take a stint in HR if you get that opportunity. Uh, and, he, and, and, you know, the rotation of managers through that HR function is what it's all about. So in this uh, slide, um, it talks about what does a human resource manager do? And it says the reality of HR managers do on a weekly basis can be seen by looking at the diary of one manager. The activity help to find the activities help define HR management in a very real world way. Here are some activities an HR manager in a 700 employee firm dealt with during a week. 
resolved an employee complaint about offensive pictures being shown by a coworker, met with the CEO to plan compensation budgets for the following year, um, met with the outside met with the outside attorney regarding racial discrimination complaint by a former employee who had been terminated because of performance problems, negotiated with a pro- pro- provider of health care insurance benefits to bring a projected 22% increase in premiums down to 14% increase, uh, reviewed the employee performance appraisal, reviewed an employee performance appraisal, appraisal with a supervisor and discussed how to communicate both positive feedback and problem areas, advised an executive on the on the process of terminating a sales manager whose sales performance and management efforts were significantly below sales goals, addressed a manager's report of a of an employee's uh, accessing pornography <laughs> pornographic websites on a company computer, hosted an employee recognition lunch and discussed the employee uh, succession plan for the customer operations division consisting of 400 employees, discussed with the other managers of the executive leadership team, the CEO, the CFO, and the division heads uh, and employee staffing of an employee staffing plan for the following year and the ways ways to reduce employee turnover. Many of these topics were part of an HR manager's job week. However, that list illustrates one fact. There's a wide range of issues that are part of the regular work of HR management. And when I read that, I said, oh my gosh, this is really, you know, as far as uh, what we, um, as far as what we see, uh, if we're trying to paint a picture of what it's like to be an HR business partner, HR manager, slash HR manager, this is really it. I mean, this really shows uh, sometimes a lot more than this, but this gives an idea of the typical, you know, the typical week or whatever for an HR manager. Um, professionalism, um, I got some links here to SHRM and to HRCI. Um, I'm going to put out a I'm put out a list of important websites, but HR departments are viewed as cost centers, provide clear, measurable financial benefits to the organization. I hate when people say that HR training or whatever are not are not in what revenue producing units. They may not be directly, but they are indirectly. Um, but uh, the Society of Human Resource Management, you will see. Tons of stuff of that presented to you over the semester because um, that is our single um, society that a majority of the HR people are members to. If they're not, they need to be because uh, uh, Sherm uh, publishes professional journals. They sponsor workshops. They created HRCI, but HR, HRCI was the certification body of Sherm. They were not. They were separate, but affiliated is the best way to put it now there's been a split and hrci still does the phr sphr and now they got an associate hp h associate phr program while while sherm has come up with a sherm certified professional and sherm senior certified professionals um, sherm has is focusing more on um competencies and competency-based knowledge, whereas HRCI is focusing on a body of knowledge. I mean, that sounds like the same thing, but it is a little bit different. And uh, so now there's two professional certifications that are out there uh, because SHRM and HRCA are no longer affiliated with each other. So, human resource professionalism and certification, HR professionals need knowledge in the following areas, employment regulations, finance, tax law, statistics, information systems. Um, There is a a big need right now that you're starting to see um, uh, analytics, HR analytics. HR analytics is going to be a wide open field uh, because... uh, what we're doing now with HR analytics is we're doing a lot of analyzing and coming up with 
solving problems before they happen uh, based on the da based on data. Uh, these are the terms that you guys can go through and read in your textbook. But the summary: the HR practices affect the ability to formulate and implement strat strategies. Rid originated from the Hawthorne studies. Understanding HR goals helps provide framework for evaluating HR activities. HR activities are carried out by both line and staff managers. It is more useful to conceptualize HR as a center of expertise within an organization. And that's it. And I um, look forward to continuing going through the chapters. This is just a brief introduction of, to get us started, and we'll start um, drilling down on a lot of those subjects in more detail. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.